invite you to turn to Luke chapter 5 this morning. We're in a little series called The Truth About God. And today we're going to look at a, the, the truth about how God uses people, which is very significant for those who are Christians because a person becomes a Christian when they're 10 years old and they live to be 90. Uh, there's 80 years between the time they become a Christian and when they go to heaven. Why would God leave a Christian on earth for 80 years? What, what, what's the purpose of it? Well, there's the purpose. And uh, there's some principles about how God uses people. In Luke chapter 5, let's read the first 11 verses. This is the calling of uh, the original disciples of Jesus. But uh, in the calling of these disciples, uh, you'll find just some classic principles that, quite frankly, you could use all through the Bible, whether you're talking about King David or Isaiah or, or Jonah. Any of those calls has these principles. They're just classic. And for me to be in the will of God, you to be in the will of God, uh, you'll have to understand these principles. So let's look at Luke chapter 5. Now it happened that while the crowd was present, uh, excuse me, pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gethsemane, or the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And Jesus got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I'll do just as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to the, their partners in the other boats for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that the boats began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear from now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So, so let's think about how God uses people. Let me just give you a little uh, umbrella truth here. Uh, whenever God wants to use somebody, he gives them whatever word you want to use. He gives them a vision or a goal. I like to call it a spiritual dream. He, he, he gives them uh, the dream for their life. And that's what he's doing with these disciples. He's saying, very generically, follow me, I'll make you fish as a man. And he'll get more specific later. For example, we could do this with all the disciples, but we don't have time. Uh, take Peter. Uh, Peter ultimately is going to be a uh, pastor of a church in Rome. Uh, and that's going to be very specific. But, but he would always, no matter what he did, he'd always would be, be a fisher of men. He'd be somebody who is trying to point people to Jesus. So let's talk about this just, just briefly, and let me go into the principles. Uh, what is a spiritual dream? Number one, it's always from God. You look at verse 10, uh, and you don't find this. You don't find Peter saying, you know, uh, when I think about all my options, I think I want to be a fisherman. He didn't think it up. Uh, Peter just sits around saying, you know, I look at the 10 different options in my life, I think I'll be a missionary. That call comes from God. He doesn't sit around saying, you know, uh, I think I'll do this, do that. Jesus looks at him and says, if you'll follow me, I'll make you become fishers of men. So the dream's always from God. Second, it requires faith. Think about this. Uh, how are you going to do this? Uh, you got any budget? You, you, you have a church building? Uh, what you going to do if you leave your business, because they, they owned a, a fishing business, what you going to do when you leave your boats and your nets and your livelihood, all you have ever known, because probably Peter was like most folks in that day. He did what his dad did. His dad did what his dad did. So probably there were numerous generations of uh, fishermen in that family. So how are you going to do this? It's going to require faith. Uh, third thing about it is, it's always bigger than you. Now think about this. He looks at a fisherman who has no theological training. Uh, Peter knew about the Pharisees. He knew about the temple. He knew, he knew about the men who stood up to teach. Peter could never do that because he wasn't a Pharisee. He was not one of those type of teachers. He didn't have the training to do that. And uh, how, how are you going to... How are you going to fulfill that dream? It's going to require faith. Uh, fourth thing I would say is it grows on you. That's always a great thing that, to know. So because we're human, sometimes good things sound good to us. For example, maybe you go to a youth camp and you hear a missionary and you think, man, I think I want to be a missionary. And that's on Monday. But it, it doesn't sound quite as good when a week goes by. I discovered this about the will of God. Whenever you're in the will of God, 
it always sounds better tomorrow than it did today. In other words, after 30 years of preaching, I'm more convinced I'm called today than I was 30 years ago. But I will tell you, when I was 19, I didn't have any doubt about being called to preach. My, my point is, the will of God grows on you. But there's times in my life, revival meetings, conferences, seminary, whatever, where uh, for a day or two, I thought, you know, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind having a call like that. I think that maybe that's what God wants me to do. And I wake up the next day and I'm like, no, nah, that, that's really not what God wants me to do. The call of God grows on you, and Peter would always be pursuing that call. And, and, and so with that in mind, the spiritual dreams, uh, how does God use people? I wrote down five principles uh, on the back of your bulletin, if you want to uh, take notes on this. I wrote down five principles, and what I like about this story is this. I like, I like the story because when it comes to God calling people, you, you, the, the principles I'm going to give you, you can see in the life of Moses, you can see in the life of Esther, you can see in the life of Isaiah. In other words, it's just a classic call, and the reality is you could see it in, in people in church history like a Billy Graham or Charles Stanley. You could see it in the life of my life or your life if we're pursuing God. The uh, first thing I wrote down was this. Jesus invites common people to minister with him in an uncommon way. He invites common people. Uh, if we wrote this story today, it might go like this. It might go like God popped down to Cedartown and called uh, folks in Polk County who worked and did trash collection. And they wrong with that job. But you probably wouldn't say, wow, if he called people who pick up trash, I could never do that. So see, if the story said this, uh, Jesus popped into Harvard University, and there were some Harvard universities in that day. There, 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 there were schools of great training. And if it said that, there'd be a temptation to say, see, there it is. You know, hey, you go to Harvard. Or if the story said Jesus popped in, and uh, he went to the home of a multimillionaire, and uh, just so happened that day there were other millionaires there, he called those men to follow him, I would say, there it is. Yeah, if I had the money, I'd follow Jesus. But it says... He popped in and called some fishermen. Now, later on, you'll find this. In Acts 4 or so, these guys are preaching, and the Pharisees say, who are these unlearned and ignorant men? The word ignorant doesn't mean they don't have common sense. It, what they were saying is, who are these men? They have no academic credentials. Nothing wrong with academic credentials. But the reality is, he calls these disciples, and they're just simply common folks. Uh, that, that's huge because of this. Most of us are common people. I, I'm a common person. In other words, if I die today, unless it's an unusual death, you don't have to turn on the world news. My death obituary won't be on the world news unless it's an, un an unusual event that causes my death, and neither will yours. Most of us are simply common people. Paul picked up on this and said this. He said, uh, see your calling over in Corinthians. He says, look at your calling. Not many noble not many highbrow, not many uh, great thinkers. Now, we'll say this. He didn't say there weren't any. In fact, Paul broke the mold. Pa Paul was an intellectual man. Paul spoke different languages. Paul had all kind of academic training. I love to read folks like C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was not a common person. That's why he died the year I was born. We still talk about him. He, he, he was just a great thinker, but it's rare. Not many folks who serve God and make an impact on the kingdom are those type of folks. So what happens is God calls common people, and if we're not careful, we begin to make excuses. Uh, well, look at these disciples. Jesus said, launch out. Go out into the deep water. And uh, let's see what you can do. They could have said, we're not going because we've already failed. In other words, we're not going to attempt it because his testimony was this. We've been fishing all night. By the way, we don't like those type of testimonies. If you ever go to a church church revival meeting, Billy Graham crusade, whatever, when he was doing those things, uh, the testimonies are always successful. In other words, I was a sinner, everything was going wrong, I got saved, and now I'm a pro football player. Uh, I was a sinner, everything going wrong, my marriage falling apart, got saved, now I'm the governor of New Mexico, whatever it is. Jesus said, Peter, you got a testimony? He says, I sure do. I've been fishing all night, caught nothing, zero, nada. Which, by the way, that's a lot of your lives. I, I've been witnessing forever. How many people got saved? Zero. Nada. Nothing. Nets are empty. I've been praying a great prayer for five years. Uh, how did God answer it? He didn't. Zero. Nothing. I've been fishing.
fishing all night and caught nothing. And so when Jesus says, launch out, we could say, I already tried it. Oh, wait. I used to work in a lot of different churches. And sometimes you would tell a church, well, maybe you can try this. You know, the common uh, excuse. We tried that 25 years ago. 25 years ago has nothing to do with the day. Uh, for example, maybe it didn't work because the timing was wrong. Maybe it didn't work because you didn't have the leaders who were qualified to do it. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, he could have said this. Lord, we're not going to launch out because of fatigue. Did, 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 did you hear that in his voice? We've been fishing all night. Let me bring this up to 2015. He's saying, Lord, hear me. I'm going to talk slow, Peter says. Maybe you don't understand. I've worked the graveyard shift. I'm tired. All I want is to go home and get some biscuits and bacon and gravy and eggs, and I'm going to bed. I, I, I'm already tired. Uh, by the way, God ever come to you and sit, ask you, invite you to do something? And the excuse is, I'm already overextended. Uh, they could have said, we're not going to go because it's fanatical. In other words, everybody knows, if you do research on this passage, uh, they fish on that particular uh, body of water, the professional fishermen that they fished at night. That's, that, that's how they always say. doesn't mean you always caught fish at night. It just meant that, that's when fish were caught. And they could have said, let, let me understand what you're saying, Lord. By the way, we do the same thing, don't we? A Bible verse says something. God says, forsake everything. And we say, well, I know it says that, but, but, but God wouldn't want me to endanger my life. In other words, we say the same thing. We make excuses all the time. We reason away the Word of God, and we don't see the great catch of fish. He could have said, Lord, let me make sure I understand why. Are you telling me we fished all night, we sat the time to fish, we know a little bit about what we're doing, Peter could say, because, well, I'm making a living doing it, my dad, granddad, great-granddad, and after all, aren't you just a carpenter? You might be a good carpenter, but have you ever paid your bills by catching fish? No, you haven't. So although you may know a lot, you probably don't know about fishing. And it just doesn't make sense. And I'm going to declare something to you today. Tell me a great story in the Bible that makes sense. You say, David Goliath made sense. It makes sense for a 16-year-old boy to fight a man who's 11 foot tall. Well, the story of Gideon makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense for an army of 300 untrained soldiers. They really weren't soldiers. 300 men who were untrained to fight about 135,000 trained soldiers. That'd be like me saying, I'm going to take 300 men today and we're going, to, we're going to find a way to go to a foreign country and we're going to fight an army of a couple hundred thousand people who are trained. It's crazy. Uh, is this not fanatical? How's Jesus going to come to the world? Uh, we believe he'll be born of a virgin. What, Lord... I, I've got some sinus in my ear. I have swore you just said he's going to be born from a woman who's never had sex. That's exactly what I said. Mark it down. Which, by the way, there's still folks in the world that scoff at that. Atheists would say, how in the world could that ever happen? Uh, it's for that. And so can I tell you on this principle, it never makes sense. All of my ministry, I've heard people say this. Now, I kind of thought God called me to preach, but, you know, 20 years ago when he thought he called me, I had a good job at Delphi. You know what they're saying? That's fanatical. Who would quit a mid-level management job at Delta to preach? That couldn't have been God. Uh, probably could have been. You know, one day, Steve, I thought God may be one of the teach Sunday school, but I, I, I'm shy. I don't like standing in front of people. So I deduced from that. He couldn't call me. Red alert. Have you ever read Scripture? All through Scripture, he calls people to do what they've never done before, he calls them to do the impossible. So, if you're taking notes, write it down. Jesus invites common people to minister with him in a common way. And I say, thank you, Jesus, today. Isn't it awesome? I don't have to live my life saying, well, you know, my dad wasn't really anybody. So I didn't really have a back. Well, I don't really have the education. Well, I don't really have the looks. I don't really have. God uses uncommon people so that when the work is done, People look and say, that must have been God. They could not have done that on their own. Absolutely. God gets the glory. The second thing I wrote down, it's in your notes, it says this. Jesus uses a common 
and familiar to do the incredible. Think, think about the story. Besides the catch of fish, there's nothing extravagant about this story besides the miracle. If you're a fisherman, what are you used to? You're used to what's in the story. The lake is not unusual. A boat is not sensational. A net is part of your business. Fish is an everyday occurrence. In other words, he uses the common. Because the truth is, and we understand this now from Scripture, that boat is not a boat, it's a sanctuary. That job is not just an office, it's a cathedral. If a person understands it, by the way, you ever worked anywhere where you took consciousness to judge it? It's just a time clock. It's just, it's just 8 to 5. But have you ever worked in a place like that and somebody else walked in and to them it was their mission field? I have. In fact, I remember one time that happened where I got convicted. Hey, they, they, they've turned into a mission field. All my excuses are out the window. Think about today. What's special about that? It's just a piece of wood. I, I'm just saying, hey, th this is just a piece of wood. Could have been made into a coffee table. Could have been made into a table. Could have been made into a house. It's just a platform. A wanna, it's just, it's just a dining hall on Wednesday night. That, that little bowl, it's just, it's just a bowl. It's just a piece of paper. It's just invite cards. And I'll tell you all through Scripture, God takes the common, the jawbone of an ass. He takes the common, walking on water. He takes the common, and He does the incredible. And only people who understand that, experience God to the nth degree. In other words, he just takes the common, the everyday. So you came today. And because you don't know this principle, it's like, what's your expectation today? Nothing. I'm just coming to church. Now, I'd be shocked if there wasn't any singing. I'd be shocked if there wasn't any preaching. But besides that, there is no expectation. And one thing we learned from this is, when you go to work tomorrow, tomorrow may be the greatest day of your life. We don't know. I tell my wife this all the time. I get to preach tomorrow. It may be the greatest day I've ever preached. I don't know, but you don't know either. But I'd much rather approach my daily assignment by saying, "Woo! wonder what God may do, instead of saying, well, oh, honey, got to drive the city town again tomorrow. I'll do it again. Got to stand up there and do it. I got to do it again. Got to look at the same old faces. I'll do it again. Got to do it again. But you know what? Some of you approach your job that way tomorrow, don't you? Are you retired? It's just a game of golf tomorrow. Really? I've seen men kneel on the tee box and give their life to Jesus. I have. Now, that doesn't happen by accident. It happens because somebody's witnessing. All it is is a day of fishing. It's a boat. It's water. It's nets. And let me tell you, uh, that's why sometimes we get excited. Like, for example... Uh, say, I'm going to go to Africa. I've been there a few times. I'm going to go to Africa, we say. The mission trip. I'm all for it. And the reason I'm for it is twofold. The first is not the primary reason. We're going to go there and do ministry. Ministry is probably going to be done anyway. they they got, they got local preachers. They don't do ministry anyway. My second reason is the, is the foremost reason. Every time I pastor in a mission trip and go off somewhere, I pray every day, God, yeah, use them, but do more than that. Give them the insight that Africa's not the only mission field. Cedartown's a mission field. You ever Google Cedartown and look at high school dropouts? Or you ever do that? You ever Google Cedartown and look at poverty in Cedartown? Cedartown's a mission field. Polk County is a mission field. And what happens is, it's like Peter and could have done. It's just a boat. It's just a net. It's just the water. Peter could have said, I'm 35 years old. He was about 35 years old probably. I'm 35 years old, Lord. I was raised in this water. There ain't nothing special. When God gets in the ordinary, he makes it very extraordinary. A uh, third principle I wrote down is this. Jesus conceals his surprises until we're willing to follow him. Everyone say it's true in scripture. I've always found it to be true in my life. In other words, it's never that I'm sitting around and I feel like God wants me to do something, it's never that God just kind of says, well, here's the money. Make your decision. The money never has come until I've said, I'm going. Come hell or high water, I'm going on that mission trip. Where are you going to get the money from I've been asking for? I don't know. For sure, anytime I've made the commitment and I knew I was supposed to go, somehow I got to go. 
I, I'm, I'm going to talk to my neighbor. I know he said he doesn't want to hear it again. I'm going to talk to him. When are you going to do it? I'm not sure. I think God will reveal to me when, when he wants me to do it. But he says he won't listen. Yeah, but I've just got a feeling I'm supposed to be ready. And you know, every time I ever had that overwhelming feeling, sooner or later, a week or six weeks or six months, the door just seems to open wide. Sometimes you leave that divine encounter and you think, Lord, I tried in my own strength for two years to have that conversation, and in one divine second, you arranged all the circumstances. He's, he's asking me the questions. Jesus conceals his surprises until we're willing to follow him. Uh, some folks sit around and they say, you know, I remember, I don't really have a great testimony, not of salvation, but a great testimony of God using me or doing this. The reason is this. It's a divine principle. God conceals his surprises until we obey him. Is there a miracle that that's not true in? First miracle Jesus ever did, he changed water to wine. But what happened before he changed water to wine? He told some men, go fill those water pots up. Those water pots, if they were small in that day, could have been 25 gallons. Lord's could have been 30 gallons. And they were about 30 gallons, we're told. Now, I don't know if you've ever carried water, but if you ever carried like a five-gallon bucket of water any distance, if it's filled pretty full, is that an easy assignment? I think about having something like 20 gallons and they didn't have any help. I mean, you just kind of put your arm around and you're doing this. There's a part of my want to say, why am I doing this? Jesus, they didn't say they wanted water. They want wine. The miracle always occurs after the obedience. Jesus walks somewhere. He does this more than one occasion. He sees somebody, for example, he sees somebody with a withered hand. He walks up to him. It seemed like he would just say, be healed. Look, your hand's healed. He always says some of this. Stretch out your hand. Here's the problem. To have a withered hand mean it looked like this. If your hand is frozen like this, that, that's, that's, that's the disease, that's the issue you have. If your hand's frozen like this, Lord, I hate to correct you, I can't stretch it forth. If I could do like a normal person, it wouldn't be withered, would it? Or Jesus walks by in John 5, a man who's lame. What's the one thing a lame man can't do? He can speak up. He can pray. Jesus says, pray. I can pray. Lame people can pray. Lift your hand. I can lift my hand. In fact, truth is, he may have had stronger hand than the arms of the average person because he may have had to kind of pull himself along the ground sometimes. One thing you can't do, you can't stand on your feet. Jesus says, stand up on your feet. Had he just said, nope, not going to even try. Tried it one time when I was young. Found out lame people can't stand. Not going to do it, Jesus. Not prudent to do it. Not going to do it. Not going to make a fool of myself. But he did it. And, and one of the reasons some of us never obey God, for example, these are true stories. The reason the guy at Delta was weeping when he told me that, because see, now he's 70-something. And that happened 25 years ago. And now he understands, I've never been complete. I've never been fulfilled. I've never, I never had the thrill of obeying God. And the reality is this. Obedience always occurs before the miracle occurs. And so Jesus conceals his surprises until we're willing to follow him. You ever follow Jesus? Ever follow the Lord? And there come days where in, in, in your life, when he's, you begin to pull the net and you're like, I, I, I can tell you a number of times I've called home. And I've told my wife to use this story. The nets are breaking. You won't believe what happened. You, it, I mean, you, you, it will bother your mind, the response. It's hard to believe. I've called home before and said, you know, those commitments we made in the mission field, this, oh yeah, you won't believe the check someone just gave me. And they have no clue as to why they gave it to me. And you say that and someone says, well, you know, if the Lord gave me that check, I'd go, that's, but that's the reason you don't get it. Because the fish didn't come until they did what? They worked all night, and in those type of uh, they they fished in, that net, I don't care how tired you were, you, you would have been a uh, bad worker. If you said, I'm so tired, just leave the nets on. Right. You got those nets and you washed them, and you, and you, and you would clean them, and you'd fold them back up because you wanted them to last. 
And so these huge nets, they're bone tired. Not just bone tired, probably discouraged. You know, probably somebody said, well, you know, we've known this, we could have just slept and I didn't catch. Hey, listen, Lord, we've been fishing all night, caught nothing. We didn't catch a brim, we didn't catch a minute, we didn't catch a baby frog. We caught nothing tonight. We're discouraged, we're tired, we're hungry. Someone may have said, you know, tell you the truth, Lord, my house payment and camel payments due next week. I don't know what I'm going to do now. Nothing. But you know what they did? Peter looks and he says this. He says, the Lord now, we fished all night. We're not sure how he said it. We, we know, those are the words he said. We don't know if he may have said, Lord, we fished all night. We don't know if he said, in, in shock, Lord, we've been, we, we fished all night. We just, we just cleaned the mats. We took an hour to do it. If we go out and throw them out one time, we got to do it again. We have to keep them clean. We, we can't throw them up overnight. They, they, they will rot. We, we can't do it. But he says, Lord, we fished all night. I actually like the King James word here. Nevertheless, it's the same word as but. I just, I just like that word. It's three words put together. Nevertheless. In spite of the circumstances. What, what, what he's saying is, Lord, I... I don't know if he said it for this reason, but these people on the bank, because remember he's teaching this big crowd, it's almost like he's saying to the crowd, hey, I'm going to obey him because of who he is, but just between me and the crowd, you understand, I, I know we're probably not going to catch any fish. Lord, we fish all night. Everybody knows you fish at night. Nevertheless, your command, and I will tell you, if you have never used that word, Maybe not in the last word, but if you've never used, if you've never said, this doesn't make sense, but I'm going to obey God. I, I doubt you're a very dynamic Christian. I doubt you're in the will of God today. Because the Christian often comes to a crossroad where he says, it makes no sense. That's not the direction to go. It, it's much easier to go this way. Everything's opening up. I mean, because, you know why? Because sometimes the, the, the devil can open up things sometimes. It looks really good. And you say, it just doesn't make any sense. There's no doors open on that road. If a door does open, it's going to be extremely hard. We don't have the money to do that. Church is not big enough. We don't have enough volunteers. Nobody knows who we are. It's an impossibility. But, Lord, because you told us to do it, we're going to launch out. Uh, that's why if you look at churches and history of churches, you know there's, there's probably a church right now it's not really a church, but there's, there's a group of people. It may just be two or three of them. And they met this morning at Starbucks. There's about three of them probably. They don't have a dime to their name, but they got a vision. And they're, and they're meeting and having their Bible study together at Starbucks, and they're saying, it doesn't make sense. Man, we got these degrees, and there's churches wanting us. But we're supposed to start a church. I can tell you, I know for a fact, a few guys who did that 10, 12 years ago, you know what? There's some of the largest churches in Georgia now. Why? Because Jesus conceals his surprises until we're willing to follow him, until we're willing to pursue him, until we're willing with passion to go after him. And some of us never have full nets. Because we won't listen to God. By, by the way, they call for their partners. That happens all the time here, doesn't it? About three weeks ago I was here. And, and, and everybody got a call. Y'all remember that call? Y'all remember? Someone got in the pulpit and said, we got a mortgage and we're paying it. Partners, come on. We need you, partners. Come on, partner. Come on with us, partner. And we broke it down for the dense Baptist. Somebody pays a lot. Somebody, hey, I'm not even a member here and I'm telling you, you ought to be paying. It's got to be, you don't have money, you don't do as much ministry. And sometimes we call for the partners. But you know what? It goes back to the other point. Oh, that's not God. It's just a boat, just water, just a net. It's just fish. That wasn't God three weeks ago. It's just a chair. It's just carpet. It's just life. It's just a pulpit. It's just a platform. It's just a building. It's just a location. It's just an address. It's just Cedar Town. That shouldn't be God. And we miss the Lord. I can't quote this right because I haven't looked at it in so long, 
it's been on my mind as I've been preaching this. Elizabeth Barrett Brown, that famous poet, uh, she says something like this. She says that the world is a cathedral. And everywhere you walk, there's a burning bush. And here's the point. She says some people take their shoes off and find God. Get this. The rest of us sit around and eat blackberries and complain all day. Isn't that true? The world's a cathedral. You say, no, it's not. I'm telling you, I, I've, been, I've been to this place. There's nothing. The only thing that makes that place special to me is I know Jesus walked on the world. I know he, I know he did this. If it wasn't for that, there's, I, there's far better bodies of water in Georgia than, than, than what this place is. It, 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 it seems, in fact, when you go to Israel, there's not much there. It, it seems like a barren land. God takes the normal, the everyday. And when we obey Him, we begin to see surprises. Uh, we begin to experience, and we'll walk away from those things and we'll say, I would have never thought. I mean, I was just obeying it. It seemed like a small step. But big doors turns on those small steps. The last thing I wrote down was this. Jesus illustrates the potential of uncommon obedience. Don't you wish you'd go back in a time machine sometime and set it for this date and go back and say to Peter, you're going to be famous. It, Peter, you ever heard of Genesis? At, yeah. You're going to write two books called First and Second Peter. Peter, you ever wish you could see people raised from the dead and you're going to pray for people. They're going to be raised up. Peter, have you ever wished that you could see a great crowd? And, and could you ever imagine him speaking? I'm just a fisherman. Peter, if you could just see Acts 2. I don't know what, how big the crowd is. I just know it's a huge crowd, but I do know this. Once you speak to that big crowd, around 3,000 souls are going to get saved. I'd go, oh no, just about Peter. Because Jesus illustrates the potential of uncommon obedience. That's the right word. It's not common. In fact, you, most of us are like the big crowd. The, the crowd was so huge on the shore. Jesus said this crowd's so huge. Peter, let, let, me, let me borrow your boat. Get, let me get out in the water with you. I, I, need, to get, I need to be back from, from, from the crowd. Well, he's a little off subject, but since we're talking about that, you ever known somebody who preached and they like to walk around? You know why that's not good to do? There's a reason you're away from the audience. You know why? They can see you. There's a reason there's a platform in every building. It's not so anybody can be special. It's when you're on a platform, it's easier to be seen. I mean, if you're walking, you know, if you, especially if somebody walks four or five rows back, I've seen guys do that. If I'm sitting in front of them, I can't see you. So Jesus knows that principle. It's great communication. He says they're too close to me. Let's get away from it. But you know what's surprising? It happens all through the Bible, by the way. You think once the miracle is done, don't you think somebody would say, hang on, Jesus, before you leave, my, my boat's over there. Why don't you get in my boat? A little selfish. I ain't caught no fish either. Come on. They don't do it. I understand why people may not cry out to Jesus to be healed. I, I mean, I understand human nature. But you would think when blind Bartimaeus could see great crowd, you think after he got healed, People say, whoa, hang on, Jesus. Whoa, man, if you can heal him, he's blind. Hey, my problem's easy. I've just had arthritis in his right knee for about 20 years. But you never see, you know why? Because it's uncommon. It's not common. Most folks are sinners. Most folks, we're not naive. Most folks never take one of those cards and do anything with it. We know that, but some will. See, there's some folks like Peter. You know the commands. There's three primary commands. One command is, and it's not too hard, Peter, let me get in your boat. Push out just a little way. Not, not too far. I say it's not too hard. I mean, if you worked all night, you may be like, eh, I hope this ain't too long a sermon. I'm about, I'm about to fall asleep. I'm, I'm graveyard chill. But then he says this. Go out to the deep. By the way, where's your deep water? The deep's different. Now, it's one thing. I don't, I don't mind. For example, some of you, I don't mind being here until 12. You let me out 1208? Oh, that's too deep for me. That's too deep. 
And then the third command. Throw out your nets again. And that's when Peter at least had to say, been fishing all night now, aren't you? But I'm going to do it because you told me to. And by the way, you know what happens? You grow. Because when, when he's first introduced about the net, he says, Master. Don't, don't misunderstand that word. Uh, that, that doesn't mean he's deity. It just simply means he's the one in control. But, but when it's over with, you notice what he says? Lord, I'm a sinful man. By the way, I'll tell you something. If you look at Scripture, you, you will always find more people falling at the feet of God or Jesus <coughs> when they see his greatness as opposed to being t told about sin. We ought to do both. We ought to do both. But, but here's Peter. I'm a sinful man. Well, time out. Sinful? Jesus said you sinful. He, well, he's sinful, but we are Lord. Jesus didn't say you're sinful. Yeah, but you see, when you begin to see God do awesome things, the, 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 the most conviction I ever get, you know when it is? It's when I'm around God and I take that baby step and he opens that door wide. And I'm like, God Almighty, Lord, I'm not worthy of being around you. And that's what happened to him. And the reason some of us don't get to experience that very much because we've got all these reasonings, we've got all these doubts, we've got all these excuses. And you ain't going to fish and I can't do it. You know, what do we say here? We're not fishermen. So we say, well, it's just, it's Sear Town. It's just Sear Town. Well, you know, uh, it's unusual. By the way, I've been preaching across Georgia for about 20 something years. I will tell you this every place in Georgia is an unusual place. If you go to South Georgia, you know what I'll say? Well, you know, it, it's South Georgia. We're not like the Atlanta area. And I can't tell you the number of guys I've seen say that. And 10 years later, they're in the Atlanta area and you preach for them. You know what they say? Man, the Atlanta area is the toughest area I've ever been in. It's so huge and we're so small. Nobody knows who we are. I got news for you. Give me one place in Scripture where it was easy to serve God. I don't care if they're in the country or the city, if they're man or woman, or if they were a young person. It's always been hard to serve God. And here's the key. God taught them in Luke 5. And then he reveals more to them, and they do something that they would probably never thought about before those first 10 verses. You know what happened? This, is, this, this to me is more amazing than the fish. Because I understand God controls everything. He can make fish jump in the boat. Jump in. That's not a big deal. I understand that. What is amazing is that these professional fishermen left everything. You know what they said? They basically just looked and said, if you want the boat and the net and the fish, have that. We're going to pursue God. That's what that, that, that phrase means. They left everything. It, it, it's, it's strong in English. In Greek, it's really strong because it means they didn't take anything. There, there is nothing in the Greek that would suggest that they said, well, uh, just in case, we may need to come back here tomorrow, just in case. That, that, they left everything because they begin to understand, not, not totally, they had to grow in it, but they begin to understand we're dealing with something here that's not natural, supernatural. We're dealing with somebody here who's not just a man. There's something about him. And then they would experience other revelations and so on. And we see it all through Scripture. For example, uh, Jesus tells them, I'm going to make you fishers of men. He didn't say that in verse 1. He waited till they obeyed. You ever read the story of King David? Uh, defeat, defeating Goliath? You ever caught this in 1 Samuel 17? It wasn't his first fight. Remember that? He said, I know I can defeat David. I know I can defeat Goliath with my God. How do you know that? In Texas, we'd say this, it ain't my first rodeo. What do you mean? I fought the bear. I fought, I fought the lion. And then he says, and God delivered that into my hand. And the reason some of us don't have that kind of worship experience, the reason some of us don't have that kind of impact, the reason some of us will go tomorrow, and I'll tell you, it's so common, we'll drive to work tomorrow. And some of us will drive and say, oh, no, it's another Monday. And, and I'm telling you, God can take everyday common things. And what you view as a school, it's not. What you view as an office, it's really not. Uh, what you view as whatever you do tomorrow, it's not just what you're viewing it is an opportunity to exalt Jesus. And what's funny about the average Christian is this. We won't do that, but we love it when we see a ten, somebody like a Tim Tebow do it, right? We exalt those people. Oh, he's using his platform. I don't have one as big as him, but I got a platform, by the way. You do too. 
And the eighth grader has a platform. They do. An eighth grader has a platform with eighth graders I'll never have anymore. And the golfer, I'm talking about people like in here, the recreational golfer has a platform with the people he or she's around. And the homemaker with a two-year-old has a platform with other homemakers with a two-year-old that Billy Graham will never ever have and never has had. And, and so what this tells us is the truth about God is he uses anybody who wants to be used. And he uses them in really common everyday experiences, but when God gets into it, he uses those people in very uncommon ways. And, and this is always my experience. When you read the scripture, think about this. When you read the scripture, fo folks don't go up to Peter saying, wow, I've never seen fish like this. They worship Jesus. I don't ever read that passage or any passage like this and say, whoo, man, those are mighty fishermen. When I get through reading, I, I sit back and say, what an awesome Lord. It's a miracle. I mean, the nets begin to break. They had to call other people to help them catch the fish. And then, I mean, I'd be this way. I'm human. I'd be thinking, I've never caught fish like this. Wow, I've got more money than I've ever had once I sell these fish. But when they understood who he was, they said, you know, and get this, we thought, we thought this was important. But in comparison to you, there's nothing as important as pursuing Jesus. And God gives us the invitation too. He says it in different ways. Launch out. He says it in different ways. P put out your nets. He says it in different ways. Pick up an invite card. He says it in different ways. Hey, we could use a few more folks. Give them monthly above what they're already giving. He says it in different ways. And I wonder today if Jesus is calling you. And if he's calling you to be a person that he wants to use in a very extraordinary way. On every head bowed, every eyes closed. We're going to have a time of invitation this morning. And you know, for you, this may be your Luke 5 experience. Who knows? For you, this may be one of the greatest days you've ever lived. I often think back to when I made a decision for Christ. Small church, I mean, maybe 50 in worship. I was the only one that walked down. Didn't think about it then, but when I was starting to preach, a few years later, because I understood more about preaching in church, I often wondered. I wonder when that evangelist went back home. So I said, well, what happened? I just one old boy walked down. About it. But I'll tell you, for me, it's one of the greatest days of my life, going to that little old church, going to that one little meeting. Seems insignificant, but God uses the common, everyday insignificant to do the significant and to do the uncommon, to do the extravagant. I just want to encourage you today to think about maybe how God is calling you. And also to begin to pray and to begin to realize when things are presented to you through a, through a Sunday school teacher, through a faithful wife or husband, through a parent who's spiritual. Sometimes they'll say something spiritual. They'll, they'll say something about God, and they don't even understand themselves how God is using that or how he wants to use it to impact your life. And it's easy to say, well, you know, I wish God would tell me something, and I'm telling you just as you enter them. I, I hear weekly opportunities. T take an invite card. Hey, we need greeters. Hey, we could use some folks on... When he's not a one, hey, we, we got a student ministry going. Always could use some volunteers. Or use some folks, maybe just pray. Or maybe use some folks who might just say, hey, here's a little bit of money. Use it to reach kids. And sometimes we just sit and we, we miss it. And God is shouting to us through a person, through a circumstance, through a prayer, through his word, through the spirit. So as we have this invitation, the altars are open, they always are open during invitation time. Maybe you need to pray. Maybe you're today and you've been looking for a church home. It's a great church. Awesome church. Uh, ha has a great past, but I think it even has a more tremendous future. I think that God's going to do a lot of great things in the future for this church. That's saying a lot because God's done a whole lot in the past. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I, I'm a Christian, but well, it's really been a long time since my nets have been full, but I know what you're talking about. 
Maybe God's saying to you, hey, don't, don't live off of 10, 20 years ago. God can fill you in that today. Maybe you're here, and this is so important, and you would say, I don't really think I know this Jesus. I know who he is, but I don't think I've ever accepted him. I don't think I've ever surrendered my life to him and asked him into my heart. I wish you'd do that this morning. Father, we come before you today and give you this invitation time. And Lord, in our life, Every time we read the Bible, every time we worship, every time we pray, for us, it's just as important as when Peter heard you speak to him in Luke 5. Lord, it's important to us. It can change who we are. You can use us. You can launch us out. You can save us. You can grow us. So we give this invitation time. Lord, whatever you want to do, we pray you do it. And the hearts of people, maybe if it's a public decision, Lord, we'll rejoice with that. But Lord, give people the courage, like, like Peter, just to say, nevertheless, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And Lord, I pray their life would never be the same. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.